everybody, welcome back to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley with you once again. Okay, so we're gonna start with Siege of Darkness. We are almost through Legacy of the Drow. Siege of Darkness is actually, I would say, my favorite Drizzt book so far for one reason, and that is the Time of Troubles. I actually really like the stuff about the Time of Troubles. Find it interesting and find it intriguing the way that it affects uh, different things, and I, I wish they had kind of done more with it affecting people that we already knew. For right now, let's talk about Time of Trouble. So it's divided into five sections, uh, which um, uh, the earlier ones were divided into three parts, and uh, starting with Legacy of the Drow, they're divided into five parts. What was frustrating is the Time of Trouble stuff, which I found the most interesting out of it all, is only one of those five sections. So not a huge part of the novel, but by far the most, most interesting. Suddenly magic starts acting up and uh, failing, and uh, there are all these cool things that just go nowhere, sadly. Like, um, for instance, we find out that one of the drow houses in Mensa Baranzan is a psionics house, not a magic house. They keep up the pretense of being magic for a little bit, but then basically move to strike, but of course they wait too long because, I don't know, they're morons? I it, it, it plays really stupidly, and they wait to move too long. You would think that they would, like, have this because the drow are all cunning and crap. You would think that they would have as like a contingency plan. Well, if magic ever failed, within hours, we are going to do this to House Bainerin, we're going to do this to, you know, blah, 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 whatever. We are going to become first house in seconds, but they don't. And magic comes back like literally just, it, it feels like a couple of days have passed. I know it's longer than that, but it doesn't feel like any sort of real time has passed. So many bizarre things in this book. Like, <laughs> I think my favorite thing about the Time of Troubles is that Guinevere gets like this action-packed adventure chapter where she has to fight against the planar chaos that's trying to overtake her, and they uh, they rescue Gwen, but it it's it's a long protracted struggle, and in the end, the frustrating thing is the Time of Troubles really feels as if Salvatore had a completed novel, and then they told him, oh, you have to put the Time of Troubles in here. And he was like, crap, what do I do with that? So he's like, well, I guess I could put this psionics um, subplot in there, and then they destroy that house, and I could do all these fun little distraction things that kind of slows down the pace of the book. Because that's really all that happens, is that the, the overall plot thrust of the book, which is... Uh, the drow attack Mithril Hall, but like in force this time, not just a scouting party, like they are hardcore gonna take him down this time. That plot just gets bogged down by the time of trouble stuff, which is frustrating because it's the most interesting thing. When the most interesting thing in your book is a distraction, that's probably a problem. Two other things, Quenthal gets introduced in this book. I have a lot of stuff after reading this that tie into War of the Spider Queen because I'm gonna have a lot to say about War of the Spider Queen once we get there, which, oh my god, as of this point, seems like 18 years off. But have faith, we will make it. We will make it, oh yes. I gotta say, also, even if you like Salvatore, I think this is probably the book for you. Like, if you're, or if you're on the fence and you're kinda, eh, this is a good book for you. Not only do we have the Time of Trouble stuff, but part five, uh, which is called Old Kings and Old Queens, so I was expecting something really different. Sadly, no one in drag that I noticed is just this gigantic siege battle, on, uh, ongoing battle, non-stop, with, I, I would say, hundreds of characters. I think pro at least dozens, at least dozens of characters, just all over the place, insane stuff happening. I don't really like Salvatore's writing, so it was difficult for me, but it is a huge battle with all sorts of different styles of fighting going on, You've got everything from the Gutbuster Brigade to uh, magic attacks to barbarians to archers, all sorts of stuff. Um, uh, it ends a little prematurely, I guess, for really stupid reasons. The drow forget that there's sun outside, and they are like vampires uh, thrown off by that. But whatever, it's 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 a big fun um, explosive climax, and I'm a little concerned as to where book four is going to go now, because it seems as if all the plots that they had been building up through these books so far are taken care of. There you go. That's uh, Siege of Darkness. On to Song of the Sorials. Not a whole lot to say about Song of the Sorials. It's good. I enjoyed it. I really, really liked it, but um, not, not a ton of stuff. Let's see. Uh, small quibble here. They use the term swordswoman 
180 times, I searched it, 180 times is the term swordswoman used. It's a burdensome word, it doesn't read well, and I understand they didn't just want to keep saying alias. I searched that, that occurs uh, nearly a thousand times. So my guess is they were just like, well, I don't want to say alias or her again. So they wanted to put something else in, but 180 times is more than once every other page. That is too often to be saying swordswoman, and she's not on every page. So this, this, is, this book is by far the biggest, craziest ensemble piece that uh, they've done in the Finder Stone trilogy. Because essentially we have most of the characters from the second book, most of the characters from the first book, and some new characters all joining together to fight Moander. I mean, that's, that's kind of the main plot point of it. And we get a lot more about Dragon Bait's people. And there is, interestingly, uh, this strange uh, subtext, I guess, all about like what it means to be a father. They've been hitting on this somewhat since book one, but here it really gets driven home. Like, the climax is kind of spurred by that, and events that lead into a lot of the spin-off books, well, I shouldn't say a lot, I think there are three total, but into at least one or two of the spin-off books. It's all about what it means to be a father, and what it means to be a good father. Uh, here's a particular quote that isn't perhaps exactly 100% that, but um, just kind of, once we're getting into the climax, it becomes really a test of how different people see the world, and how different people see the point of living. And I really like this quote. To get something more out of life, a man must live for others. No monument, no empire, no song or tale left to posterity will satisfy the soul the way bringing joy to another person will. I just thought that was such a great way to sum up this character, who we've seen since book one, but we've never really had him talk about what drives him beyond, like, uh, love for magic and uh, love for his wives. So overall, really good book. Really enjoyed it. Really enjoyed the trilogy altogether. I'm curious to get to the spin-off books, but I'm glad that we're going to have a little bit of a break before we get there, because I generally don't like reading uh, multiple book series all at once. I find it a little frustrating, and it's uh, that's made going through this very difficult as well because it's like for uh for probably a month now all i've been reading is finder stone and drizzt and as much as i love finder stone and as much as i don't hate the drizzt stuff much and i can easily skim it it gets a little old all right so both of those happen in 1358 which is year of shadows the uh, year of the time of troubles now let's talk about whisper of waves yes that's right i'm actually getting it around to whisper of waves which starts in 1326 and goes to 1364. Now, most of it takes place towards the end there in the 1360s or so, but because it tra traverses such a huge amount of time, I felt like it's okay to go ahead and mention it now, and I thought I'd get it out of the way because it's one of the few that has a, a decent amount in it that occurs pre-Time of Troubles that I wanted to talk about. So let's go ahead and talk about that. A few things to say about this. First of all, oh my God, it's like reading YouTube comments, sometimes reading Amazon comments. A lot of people, th there's one Amazon, comment that just irked me to no end because he's like, you know, I really enjoyed this book and loved it and da -da -da -da, until I read The Fountainhead. This is the same book, blah, 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 and just bitched about that and how horrible that was. And I heard that and I was like, really? I have to read this book. And that's the whole reason I picked it up and read it in the first place. And when I read it, <laughs> it the first thing that struck me is the, uh, I don't know if it's acknowledgments or prelude or dedication, whatever it is, something in the front, Philip Athens says, this book borrows heavily from the Fountainhead and Anthem. So it's like, he's not hiding it, first of all. It's not one of those things where if you get it, oh, you're sly and coy and you can feel better about yourself, and if you don't, it's still just a good book and you'll never know what you're missing. No, he right up front says, I'm basically stealing this plot from Fountainhead. Beyond that, why is it so crazy to take a work of literature and remake it into a Realms novel? I mean, essentially, as we've touched upon before, Escape from Undermountain is Escape from New York. I'm sure lots of the other things that are out there are reworkings of things. One of my favorite uh, Warhammer fantasy books, which I don't like many of them, so saying one of my favorites quite a lot is uh, Nathan Long's. Uh, it's the third one of his uh, Blackheart series where he completely and totally does a Weekend at Bernie's riff. And I granted the entire thing isn't a ripoff of Weekend at Bernie's, though that would have been awesome. But still, he does that and it's like, you get the reference, you laugh, yet it still totally works for the story. Same thing here. I mean, it's uh, basically the premise behind the story beyond the plot, the premise behind the story is what if you had an objectivist in the realms and what would that be like? So it's it's the story of an objectivist and basically all the people revolving around him. Uh, the plot, I guess, is of, of the trilogy, not of this book. The plot of the trilogy is a realms-changing event because 
this guy builds a canal that increases trade between two places, or at least that's what he's gonna attempt to do. I don't know if he's successful. Which I'm just like, that's awesome. That's really, really interesting and fascinating and a new take on what you can do in fantasy literature. Much like, for instance, Midnight Tides, the fifth book of uh, Stephen Erickson's Malazan Book of the Fallen, which had a plot which was all about what if we take down the economy by taking away the gold that the economy is based on? Which I just, Oh my god, that blew my mind. Like, such an awesome idea and not something that you would see very often. Much like Prince of Lies, um, the uh, fourth book in the Avatar trilogy, which is all about Siric decides that he's going to... I mean, this is, you know, spoiler, I guess, whatever. But Siric decides that he's going to, like, bring people to his cause by writing a book about how awesome he is that has a spell cast on it that makes whoever reads it believe it. And I'm just like, that's great. Like, a, a book being the kind of evil, evil thing. It's a little bit Care Bears too, but <laughs> it totally works. Another thing people seem to love to bitch about online about this book is the fact that the chapters are short. Well, again, it's a, like, classic literary trope to do that. It fits. The chapters never overstay their welcome. They say exactly what they need to say, and then they're done, which I loved. I absolutely loved. I mean, there's next to no filler in this book. There's maybe a line here and there that could be thrown out. That's it. Otherwise, it's a concise, perfectly well put together book. There are all sorts of interesting characters. We have a, a Janazi senator who like came from the streets. We have this Red Thay wizard who's um, doing something. There's some sort of plot that uh, Thay has him in this town going on about. I can't remember the name of the town. Uh, it's obviously in a port. And you have uh, the main guy who's Ivor Deverast. He's the objectivist. And then uh, kind of the, the woman he's somewhat sort of wooing or however you want to phrase it. And then like the other guy who uh, is also an architect who's starting to steal off of his stuff and da 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 da, -da. All sorts of interesting stuff. Uh, the plot is intriguing. Definitely enough to keep me interested. So who cares if the chapters are short? What does that matter? Why would anybody give a damn about that? Another couple of things about this book. It is one of the very few times that I've ever liked dwarves because the way that they present dwarves in this book is they are essentially objectivists as well because all they care about is doing a good job building rock things. Like, they, they go out and they smash stone all day and they are pleased with what happens. And I'm like, that's awesome. That makes sense. And you always see that dwarven pride in their stone craftery or whatever, their dungeoneering and things like that. But we never actually see them doing it because they're always out drinking or fighting or blah, 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 whatever. So I was like, that's a really... It's not like it's anything new because it's always kind of there in dwarven, dwarven lore. But it, it just, it's such a great take on them, I think. And, like, they get along really well with Ivor because he's not afraid to do work and he doesn't talk a lot and he just kind of keeps to himself and they're all... They work really well with him. The other thing that I want to say about this book, and I might come back to it once I get to the sequels, but the other thing I want to say about this book is that I finally kind of realized with this book what objectivist quote-unquote heroes are in my mind. They are Asperger's rapists. <laughs> because if you... Look at it, I mean, the sex scene in here, oh my god, it is so brutal and vivid. It doesn't hold back at all. I was really shocked that he went where he did, because most of these books, though I wouldn't classify them as young adult, I would say they are safe for young adult. This one, however, is like, holy crap, like, you know, first of all, any kid would just be bored about, like, all the talk about architecture, I'm sure. And then beyond that, the, uh, the rape scene, which I'm, I'm sorry, it's a rape scene. Like, I, I don't care how, like how much he knows women and he doesn't have to say anything as he takes it from her and blah blah blah. It's like she's fighting it, she doesn't say yes, she says no, it's a rape scene. So yeah, Asperger's rapist. So the next time you read The Fountainhead, just think of that every time Howard Rourke speaks, won't you? But, and not to belabor the point here, but that doesn't mean it's a bad book. That doesn't mean that he's a non-interesting character or a character that you hate. He's fascinating to watch. Just because somebody is an unlikable character doesn't mean that they don't belong as the protagonist of a book. And this is pretty much an ensemble piece, but he is, I would say, still the protagonist. So yeah, don't take that to mean that I am backhandedly saying don't read this book. It is awesome. It is really, really good. I don't know if the rest of the trilogy will pan out, but I hope so. All right, that's all I've got to say for, it, uh, for now, and we are out of time, so I'll talk to you next time. This is Michael T. Bradley, Realms Remembered.